Welcome back to Calvary Life. This is a podcast of the, the ministry of Calvary Baptist Church, and uh, it's for the membership of Calvary Baptist, but if you are also out there in the local Baptist church and uh, can glean from this, we'd especially uh, are glad you're part of it. I'm Charles Uptang. Hey, I'm Paul Thompson. We have a super special guest today, and um, Danielle, how about... Instead of me giving all the rundown, we'll give all the bio for Denny. How about this? We'll link it, so I want to get right into some conversation. Um, but I'll just give you a quick bio of Denny. I'll let him introduce himself however else he wants to. Um, not only is he a seminary professor, um, college professor, he's a local church teaching pastor, he's the president of the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. Uh, Dr. Burke has authored some books that we're very interested in. We have these in our resource center. One of these we'll be using in an open class setting uh, starting in just about a week and a half. Um, that's a brand new book. Male and Female, he created them, a study on gender, sexuality, and marriage. So we're looking forward to that. But he's also authored uh, a couple other books that are pertinent to our subject today in this weekend of our Bible conference on sex, gender, and the church. Uh, he wrote What is the Meaning of Sex, co-authored the book Transforming Homosexuality, and has written and lectured on this subject extensively. So... Uh, Dr. Burke, appreciate you being here and appreciate the messages you brought um, to the congregation already. So just want to welcome you. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Um, I want to jump in just a couple of questions. And let me say this to sort of preemptively. If you're just listening to this podcast without having heard any of the messages, uh, we will have some some messages. I think we'll have our – just as I write, we'll have a Sunday message available out um, probably about the same time this is out. I would encourage you to go back and listen to it, really give you a foundation that will be super helpful to um, what we're talking about. Uh, Denny, I want to start with kind of some big picture stuff here because our people hear these terms, and I think there's some confusion and maybe some caricatures about them. We talk about this in elders' meetings. We talk about it some in congregational settings that we – are complementarian. We take a complementarian position. Can you can you give everybody just kind of a I don't know a thumbnail sketch? What are we talking about? Biblical complementarianism. What is it? What is it not? Um, complementarianism is just a word we use to describe what we think the Bible teaches about manhood and womanhood. And um, we think, or I believe, um, that the Bible teaches that God made man and woman distinct. Um, they um, have certain differences and they have certain things in common. What they have in common is that they're both equally created in the image of God. So when you read uh, Genesis 1, 26 through 28, it says that male and female, he created them in the image of God. He made them. So male and female are created equally in the image, in the image of God, which means, among other things, that they have human dignity and value and worth that is equal. A man's not more important than a woman. A woman's not more important than a man. A woman's not less important than a man. A man's not less important than a woman. We have equal value and worth before God. And that's why in our laws, for example, um, there's not one penalty for killing a man and a different penalty for killing a woman. Um, there's not one penalty for killing a white man and a different one for killing a black man. And all people are created in God's image. And fundamental justice means that we all recognize that. And when it comes to gender... Um, it doesn't matter if you're male or female. We're all equal in that sense. So um, complementarians affirm that. Um, complementarians also affirm that there are differences between male and female that are important, that the Bible teaches, and that you can see in nature. Obviously, we have bodily differences. We're organized for reproducing in a different way. Um, some people are organized for reproducing as a father. Others are organized for reproducing as a mother. And that's how we know that it's between male and female. Um, but we also believe the Bible teaches that there are responsibilities that go along with being male and female, special callings on our lives. And so that husbands, we believe, are called to be the leaders and the protectors and the providers in their home. And wives are supposed to be affirming of that leadership, following that, that leadership. Um, and so within the home, there's a difference in calling there. It not, neither calling is more or less important than the other, but they're both vital. Uh, in the church, we believe that that means that uh, God has called biblically qualified men to serve as pastors and leaders within churches. So within the church and the home, the differences kind of cash out most clearly in Scripture. You've got a principle of male he um, headship um, that you see in the family with the father being the head and the husband being the head, and then the... Um, uh, the church authorized leaders are the uh, which are biblically qualified men are called to be pastors. 
Um, so that's complementarianism in a nutshell. Um, maybe that's more than you wanted, but no, no, that's, great. That, that's what it looks like. No, I want a summation. Uh, and let me say this. Um, the word complementarian is a mouthful. And I'm, this view existed before the word existed. Okay, we we just coined a term to refer to what the ancient biblical teaching is. Okay, so the teaching is old, even though the term is new, and it got coined um, in the '80s as a way to summarize what you know, basically traditionally people believed who were Protestant Christians for a long time. But because the issue was contested, we needed to articulate it and give a name to it, and it was contested in the later part of the 20th century because of feminism. And, uh, and so, but anyway, we have a term complementarianism. Now, why do we have that term? Well, it's deeply rooted in Genesis. Genesis teaches that in Genesis 2.18, God, it says that God, he, he was going to make a helper suitable for the man. And the helper suitable is this term, is in Hebrew, it's this term, azor, konegdo. Um, azor means helper. And then suitable is, is this prepositional phrase, connect go, which means something like corresponding to. So God says, I'm going to make this other person who corresponds to the man. She corresponds in the sense that she completes the man as a reproductive complement. So you see what I'm getting yeah, at? Yeah. So that's complementarianism. So there's a, a biological complementarity, and then there's also a social complementarity in terms of the callings that God puts on their lives. So that's where the term came from. I'm, I'm less interested in people adopting a certain term as I am just believing what the Bible teaches. You spoke a little bit about some realms where that plays out in most obviously. One of those, of course, is the church. So this is what I was wondering. I know what we've taught here, and um, I know what you would teach would be would be the same. We may not say it in the exact same words, but the principle would be the same. The biblical concepts would be the same. But when you get pushed back on this idea, how do you address that with churches or individuals in churches? We, we lost a couple of members here several years ago on the issue of women as pastors, not being able to fulfill the same roles, that God has not called them to the same roles and responsibilities, and teaching that, believe that's consistent with uh, pastoral epistles, et cetera. So how do you address the the other side on that? When someone says, I don't see this in Scripture, or I don't believe that's true, I don't, I don't understand why a woman can't be a pastor, for instance. I don't understand why we can't have a woman preacher or, or that sort of thing, why you're restricting us, why you're denying us the ability to use our gifts, et cetera, et cetera. How do you, how do you respond to the argument? Well, it's just the clear teaching of Scripture. Um, in the Bible, you in the New Testament in particular, you have all these specific directives about how the church's ministry is supposed to unfold. So Paul says, for example, in 1 Timothy 2.12, I do not allow a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Now, when he says, I don't allow a woman to teach, he's not talking about teaching geometry or arithmetic. He's talk, In context of 1 Timothy, he's talking about teaching the Christian faith. And also, and this is, this is important, when he uses the word teach, what he means is basically what you and I mean by preach. Because um, sometimes I'll hear people interpret that verse as if Paul doesn't allow a man to gain information from a woman. That's not what that's talking about. He's talking about teaching the faith in the context of a, of a local church. And what happens in, because you remember like later in chapter four, he talks about you need to exhort, right? You have to command, prescribe these things. So teaching is more than just an information download. It's fundamentally authoritative because you're telling people what to do. So a, a pastor, if he's doing his job right, he stands in the pulpit, he explains what the Bible means, and then he commands people to obey it. His authority is in the Scripture. It's not his own personal authority. It's in the Scripture. And so you explain the Bible, you command people to obey the Bible. That's what's happening in biblical teaching, what you and I call preaching. So um, Paul says, I don't allow women to teach like that. I don't allow that to happen in a church. And, and then he says, or exercise authority over a man, but they are to be in um, silence. Or we can talk about what that word means, means later if you want. But he, he's prohibiting teaching and exercising authority, which are activities that go together. And the fundamental job of a pastor in a church is to lead, to exercise authority. He's prohibiting 
the key function of a pastor, which is leading and exercising authority. So, I mean, there, right there, you've got Paul saying, here are two things I don't allow to happen in a congregation. Right after that, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, he says, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, which we, in our understanding is the office of pastor, he, de- he, aspires, he desires a good thing, if any man be the husband of one wife. Now, I don't know any woman who can be the husband of one wife unless you've got two women together, and then we have a whole other problem. Um, in other words, it, it's very clear that Paul is assuming right after this command about, I don't allow one to teach or exercise authority, that it's qualified men. And then he gives a list of qualifications, which are mainly character qualifications. So you can't disconnect all those texts. That's one principle in this, this the continuity and, and the context. It all goes together. And in the argument that some would make, and I'm sure you've heard this many times, maybe students will bring this up in a classroom, is this Paul's opinion? Is Paul just speaking culturally? This is just the times he was in. This is the setting he's in. This is this is talking to Timothy and Ephesus and the abuses of women and pagan religion, blah, blah, blah. Or is this rooted in something else? And I know from what we heard from what you taught in the conference, it's really rooted all the way back in Genesis, not in Ephesus, not yeah. in the culture of Ephesus. Paul Paul's goal in all of his teaching that we see revealed in the New Testament, he's never trying to innovate. He's always trying to teach what he believes was reflected in the Old Testament and now has been made most clearly manifest through Christ. So he's preaching a revelation that was given to him. He's not making this up. He's not just like shooting from the hip, oh, here's what I think, and you take it or leave it. That's not what he's doing. So people should interpret his words as, I do not permit, as this is just my opinion. No. You so do what you want. There is a whole stream of interpretation that has come up, well, frankly, in the last several decades. It didn't exist in church history until feminism became an issue. <laughs> okay. But so think about that. The entire history of the New Testament church, nobody's interpreting 1 Timothy 2.12 to mean, oh, I personally don't allow this, but please, all of you feel free to do differently than what I say. No, when Paul wrote to these churches, he was writing as an apostle. He makes that clear up front in so many of his letters. I, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, like he says in Romans. He's trying to say, I have authority here, and what I'm saying is what you should be doing in the churches because I'm speaking on behalf of Christ. And so Paul says in 1 Timothy 2.12, I don't allow a woman to teach or to exercise authority over man, and then he tells you why. For Adam was formed first and then eved. Right, So the immediate reason he gives is not because of Artemis worship in Ephesus or because of some false teachers in Ephesus, not because of some local situation. There could have been a local situation. That's not why he says he's saying it. He says, I'm, do, I'm telling you, don't do this because Adam was formed first and then Eve. He's appealing to the order of creation. He's saying that there's something significant about the fact that God made Adam first and then Eve being made second. So Paul's telling you right there, I have my Bible open, and I'm reading the book of Genesis, and I'm telling you what the book of Genesis means. It's important that God made Adam first and then Eve second. Now, if all we had were Genesis 1, we wouldn't even know that. So now we know Paul's reading Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, we find out that God makes Adam from the ground, and then after that, he makes Eve from Adam's side. And what's going on there in that order of creation? Well, we find out that there's already a leadership dynamic happening in Genesis 2, before there's any sin in the world, before there's anything is corrupted by the fall, you've got Adam naming the woman, for example, which is, an, which is a function of authority. All the original readers would have seen that. Um, it's like Adam naming the animals, in fact, right? He's, he's ruling and subduing the earth as he's naming. Same thing is going on there when he's naming the woman. He is, he's leading. It's a position of authority. Um, also, you see there in Genesis chapter 2... Um, God gives a command to Adam. He speaks the command to Adam. Where is Eve when God speaks the command to Adam? She's not even created yet. Where does Eve receive this command from? From Adam. She gets it from from Adam, okay? And so there's this order of creation in Genesis 2 where you've got God, the creator, and then you've got Adam, the first born the first of the create the first person created then eve who's taken from his side and then god telling both of them to do what to rule over everything including the beasts of the earth so you've got this ordering there god man woman both of them ruling over the beasts of the the earth chapter 3 okay what do you have 
It's that order turned upside down. It's the beast of the earth, the serpent, coming to the woman, who then goes to the man, both of whom then evade God. So you've got the beast telling the woman what to do, the woman basically influencing the man what to do, and both of them evading what God told them to do. So there's a reversal of the order of creation there, and it's satanic. And so when Paul says, Adam was formed first and then Eve, he's talking about the order of creation, implying how God designed things in terms of leadership. And in the first marriage, he designed the husband to be the leader of the wife. And when the fall happens, it's a reversal of that order. So Adam was formed first and then Eve. And it wasn't Adam who was deceived, but Eve being quite deceived fell into transgression, it says in 1 Timothy 2.14. And so Paul's drawing attention to this reversal of the order of creation. There's a natural order of things that God intends. And what's interesting here, and a lot of people miss this, is that In 1 Timothy 2, he's talking about what's supposed to be going on in the teaching ministry and the leadership ministries of the church. But he's basing it upon a norm that applies to marriage. Adam was formed first and then Eve. That's not a church. That's a family. That's a marriage. And so what Paul is saying in 1 Timothy, he says the same thing in 1 Corinthians 11. He's showing us that the church's structure and its leadership structure is not supposed to create any tension at all with the family structure, which is pre-political, before there's a church, there's a family. And if you've got a husband at home leading his wife, and she's supposed to be affirming that leadership, but then you come to church and she's commanding him from the pulpit, do this and do that, that you, puts a strain yeah, on two, that relationship. Two systems at odds with each it, other. It makes a total, it, it's a structure that would be at, at war with the family structure. And so that's why you see the church's leadership structure formed the way it is. It's, it's a derivative of the, of the family structure. And so you're never going to have that, that kind of a reversal. Um, so, I mean, th- that's why, anyway, that's the way Scripture teaches this, and it's not arbitrary. It's, it's really from the very beginning. So speak to this just a little bit, Denny, just in case anybody's mishearing what we're saying. Now, if, if somebody's listening and this sounds foreign to you or, you know, just something you recall a, to hearing this, just you know, the way you think through things. The next phase of this, which you taught us in the in the conference, I thought was so helpful. Speak just a little bit on how this is not only God ordained, this is what God has created, how God created it, but it's good. The goodness of this, this structure, this plan. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, First Timothy four, uh, four and five says, you know, everything created by God is good. And Paul says that in reaction to false teachers who were saying that getting married is bad. You should abstain from marriage. And Paul says, no, everything created by God is good. And he's just reflecting on Genesis again. He's reading Genesis 1, where after through every, you know, throughout the six days of creation, God looks at what he had made and he sees that it's good. And then after he makes the man of the woman in marriage, he sees that it's very good. Um, and so Paul is in in first Timothy saying everything created by God is good, including marriage. And so if God has declared something to be good, it's totally wrong and against his will for us to in any way act as if it's bad. And so if God, if there's an inherent structure to the marriage relationship, for example, where a husband's called to be a leader and a protector and a provider, like Ephesians five teaches and like is implied in Genesis two, if if God really has done that and it's called good, we can't treat it like that's bad and say, no, we're just going to create our own marriage structures. We're going to create our own marriage norms. I mean, our culture is in the middle of a long project of undermining marriage norms. And if we're going to be faithful disciples of Jesus, we can't join them in that. I wonder if we've almost succeeded at that. I mean, if you were to judge what you see on television or movies by it, it seems like the the norm of marriage is, has totally shifted. I mean, it seems like at least as far as the... The PR campaign, the secular PR campaign, we've already we've already redesigned. It's hard to find any example of a healthy, normal, functioning marriage depicted in secular media. You know, in some ways, that's been that way in every age, and I, I don't think it's an accident. Ephesians five says, um, you know, Ephesians five quotes from Genesis two: "For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh." That's Paul quoting from. Um, Genesis 2, 24. But then Paul says, for this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ in the church. Um, for Paul, when he says mystery, he doesn't mean what we mean by it. 
when we talk about a mystery, we're like something mysterious. We don't know what it what it is. It's opaque to us. We don't understand it. Paul's use of the word mystery means something that was once unclear in the Old Testament has now been revealed through the gospel. There was something that may have been unclear in previous ages, but now after Christ has been clear to everybody. And what Paul is saying is that one flesh union of marriage was always designed from the beginning to image forth this deeper relationship, this other marriage, the marriage of Christ to his church. This mystery of great is great. I'm speaking with, of, with reference to Christ in the church. So marriage, God put marriage in the world from the very beginning to be a little enacted parable of the gospel, of the way that Christ loves and leads and sacrificially dies for his bride. Every marriage is supposed to be exemplifying that. So here's the, here's the issue. If you were the devil, and that's what marriage is, well, what would you be doing to marriage in every age and in every place? You'd be trying to distort that thing as best you could. And if you're in ancient Greece and you're the devil, you're trying to get these patriarchal men to be abusive and mistreat their wives, you know? to sleep with their slaves. And you could just go through every age and you can see how the image, the icon of the gospel that is marriage has been distorted and rebelled against. And that's our age is no different. We may have our own peculiar flavor to it, but I mean, that's what's happening in our age right now. There is a war on what marriage is because we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against powers that are high up and in spiritual places, and they don't want people to see the gospel. Um, um, these powers want the gospel to be obscured in our marriages. On complementarianism in general, I want to talk about a specific issue that relates to Southern Baptist life in just a moment, but how far do, how far do we extend this, um, these roles and responsibilities? We've talked about the home and the church. Do they extend beyond that? Does this go into the business world, political world? Um, relationships that don't include marriage yet, boyfriend, girlfriend, that sort of thing. How, do, how, does, how does that play out in those realms? Uh, the answer is yes and no. Um, um, is Do your marriage obligations, for example, so, so let's say do a wife's obligation to her husband extend to other men? No. Okay, she has, the husband is the head of his own wife, Ephesians 5 says. He's not the head, I'm not the head of your wife and you're not the head of my wife. Um, that's a specific covenantal obligation. Um, your wife is not called to affirm my leadership and mine's not yours. You know, she's supposed to be following your wife follows yours. Mine follows mine. So, um, Paul says in Ephesians five twenty two, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. So all women submitting to all men is a misunderstanding of headship. Headship is a, mar- is a marital obligation. And, um, there is a special, um, relationship of one being a leader and the other affirming and following that leadership. So that's a covenantal obligation. And you're being unfaithful to your marriage if you treat other men the same way that you would treat your husband in that way. Um, and then, of course, in the church, th- there's an obligation that we have, all of us, not just women, but all of us, to submit to the God ordained leaders of a church. You know, Hebrew says, obey your leaders, they're going to give an account. So, so we, we, all, we all do that. Now, the question is, how does that extend outside of the realms of the church and the home? Um, no, it's not the exact same thing outside of the church and the home. But yes, there are implications of this. I don't stop being a man when I start relating to other people in the world who are not in the church and the home. And a woman doesn't stop being a woman when she's relating to, to others. You know, we were just talking in church about, you know, if, if I hear somebody sounds like they're breaking into my house in the middle of the night. I don't look at my wife and say, Hey, won't you go check that out? I don't do that uh, because I have a specific responsibility as a husband to protect and to provide. Now I would argue that even outside of my home, if I'm at work and there are shots fired down the hallway, the men in the classroom don't look at the women and say, why don't y'all go check that out? In other words, I, I think we have a responsibility that attaches to us as men as God has made us to be men. We're stronger. We're faster. We are supposed to be standing in between women and children in danger. Now, where's your chapter and verse on that? Well, it's not really a, it's not a chapter and verse. It's a consequence of nature. 
In other words, the Bible teaches that we're, we have a natural design, and there are just natural consequences that come as a, as a result of that. You say, how is that rec- recognized in Scripture? Well, you have it in stereotypical expressions like in 1 th- Corinthians 16, where, um, where um, Paul says to the Corinthians, I'm going to read it to you so I don't... Um, uh, misquote it. He says in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Some people will say, well, that's irrelevant because he's addressing this to everybody in the congregation. Well, of course he is. He, he's addressing men and women in the congreg- congregation, but he's using this word on esai, which means literally act like men, which I think is a way of saying be courageous. Now, are both men and women supposed to be courageous? Courageous, Yeah. There's a way for a woman to be courageous, a way for a man to be courageous. We're all called to courage, especially when following Christ. But here you have Paul using this stereotype that masculine strength is associated with courage and with being courageous. Now, he's calling the whole church to this specific masculine virtue. But can you see that he stereotypically made this into a masculine yeah. virtue? In other words, there is a is, standard that he, that's understood. There's, there's a that substructure he's... here that he's assuming nature. Yeah. Everybody understands this. And it doesn't make any sense if, if right. you, don't, if that's if, not if you don't read it that way. So, so yes, there are implications for our differences as male and female outside of the home and the church. It's not like all women sub- submit to all men. That's not the implication. But it does mean I think there are special responsibilities related to our callings as male and female, and that we ought to encourage that and not fight against it. I think our culture tries to fight against it. So, I mean, almost every movie you go to, think about – it doesn't even have to be a superhero movie. It could be any movie. Every time they defic- depict a woman fighting in combat with a man, all the differences disappear. They are just like men. They can make them. They can throw them in across the room. Does anybody believe that's real? That's not real. It's imaginary, right? And in real life, that's not how things work. Okay, men and women are different, and there are social consequences of those differences that we ought to embrace and recognize. And this stuff that we just see all around us. I mean, you, you mentioned it in the open session with all of our small groups that you know, we're just marinating in this now. Um, I mean, do we attribute this to this is really we're seeing the real evidence, the fruit of real spiritual warfare. It's just there's just a constant onslaught against every biblical norm, every biblical standard, because this is everywhere. You mentioned something in your message about a um, little aside, a little anecdote. Look for this in every Disney movie. And it's kind of ironic because we were talking about that just just the morning before we're watching a movie with my granddaughter. She's sitting there watching, let her pick a Disney movie. So she picks, uh, I can't remember, it's like Lion King 2 or something, one of the awful derivatives. But I'm watching a scene on it. I said, did you catch this here? So here's the the boy cub that doesn't want that role of leadership and is told it's fine, doesn't take it. Here's the girl cub who's basically, the whole indoctrination, here's a three-year-old listening to this. She can be anything he can be. She can be the leader of the you know, she can rule the the pride lands and all that. And I thought, you know, it's just it's totally contrary to nature. To what you actually see. If we were actually <laughs> studying this, we're not gonna see, you know, but but that's just the norm. I mean, it is the seed that all of our all of our kids are swimming in. No, that's right. I mean, there is such a thing as nature. And Paul appeals to it in Romans one, when he talks about homosexuality, for example. He says, you know, women were leaving the natural use of the man and wanting other women against nature. You know, Paul is, he doesn't explain nature there. He's just assuming everybody knows what he's talking about. And for Paul, nature is referring to God's order in creation. And we either live in accord with that order or not. And it it impacts, you know, every area of our lives. So, yeah, there's some very specific revelation in the Bible about how we relate to one another as men and women in the home and in the church. Very specific commands, some things that are very specifically spelled out. And we would, at, at minimum, obviously all agree to that, but it would not be consistent with Scripture to say that there are no other implications for being a man and a woman in the rest of the world. Um, there, there are implications. I thought something you said that was terrifically uh, pastoral when you're using the analogy of how we use a hammer with the, with the whole idea that to go contrary to nature 
is ultimately destructive. We're, we're destroying ourselves. We're destroying the foundations with that. Uh, I thought that was just a, a super analogy on that. Maybe you can reuse it for those who didn't hear. Well, I mean, you could summarize it in a nutshell. Well, all I, all I was saying is everybody knows what a hammer is for. It's, it's made for driving nails. You can use a hammer for lots of different things and make it useful. You know, you could, if you're locked out of your car, you could use a hammer to get in it. You know, I, you'd, you'd break stuff in the process. It'd be real expensive, but you could get into your car if you want. You could use it that way. If somebody's standing in your way when you're trying to watch the television, well, you could move them with a hammer, but you're going to hurt them. You're going to bring some destruction and pain into somebody's life if you do that. God's design and creation is like that. You can either work with his design and in accord with his design, or you can go against it. And if you go against it, eventually you're going to hurt somebody or yourself. Now, you could make it some short-term gain by ignoring his design. It'll feel like some kind of gain. But in the long term, it's not going to be that way. But that's what people are doing when it comes to sexuality and gender. They're just ignoring God's design, and they're expecting the world to bend to their notion of what they think everything should be. But you know what we confess as Christians is that this is our Father's world, whether people acknowledge it or not. And you can suppress the truth and unrighteousness all you want, but it's still his world, and it works according to what he says. And you're going to hurt yourself if you ignore that. I mean, if you look, I mean, look now just in the aftermath of the sexual revolution. Look what's going on in places where people are ignoring God's design, that marriage and sex are supposed to go together, for example. We've had generations of this now going on in the United States, and we're not, we're hardly replacing ourselves. The replacement rate in reproduction, it, it's if it weren't for immigration, we'd be below replacement weight rate right now. Um, in China, look what happened. You know, was it was it in accord with God's order of creation that you tell families that they can have one child, and if they have more than that, then you may have to have a forced abortion? No, that, that was not good. And so what happened there? Well, they preferred to have boys. And so women would abort female childs or, 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 or leave female children to die in some way. And so now you've got this population where there are a million of Chinese young men outnumbering Chinese young women by the millions. They're never going to be married. They've wiped out generations of females with this garbage. Now, they thought they were doing population control, but what they were doing was suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. They were kicking the goads, and now their feet are bloody. And what are you going to do with these generations of men who have no prospects for marriage? This is what happens when you ignore creation design. This is our Father's world. We live in it. And we can ignore that design or we can live in accord with that design. Then you give a final word to church. Um, people who are listening, they attend church, either it's here at Calvary or other churches. Give kind of one final challenge to them, okay? In, in light of all this, give me give me a takeaway. What, what do I do as a as a father or a husband or a, a mother, a wife, uh, even a single person, a person who's committed to the Lord, wants to live faithfully to King Jesus in this, in this crazy time that we're in, give me something to take away. Well, the first thing is, is that you want to recognize that God's calling on your life as a man or a woman is a part of your discipleship. This is not like a niche Christian emphasis, you know, <laughs> this is a part of your life. Um, if you are a, a husband... God is calling you to be a leader and a protector and a provider. If you have a son, if he's ever going to be married, he's going to need to be a leader and a protector and a provider. Dads, that means you got to learn, you got to be that. You can't abdicate. You've got to lead. And you've got to lay down your life for your wife, right? The kind of leadership that the Bible talks about is a sacrificial leadership because it's modeled after Jesus. His our headship is modeled after his. It's a real authority, a real leadership, but it's self-sacrificial. Your headship doesn't exist so that everybody can you know, bow and scrape before you. It exists so that you can exemplify Christ to the world. And so, husbands, you got to live into that. You've got to raise sons that aspire to that. Um, you can't let the world catechize our, your children. You've got to teach your children. Wives, you have to embrace what God's called you to be as, as a woman to affirm the leadership of your husband and to bring up children who affirm the, the the same. So, I mean, literally this, this affects everybody's life in myriad practical ways, but those are just a couple of things because that you need to remember because the, the, the culture is militating against this. The culture is telling you that what 
the Bible says and what's revealed in nature that it's foolishness and that you're a bigot and you're hateful if you embrace it. When the Bible says, no, you're just embracing the fact that this is the way God has made us and he's put a calling on our lives that we want to embrace it because we love him. Man, well, we appreciate so much, um, not only your time here, but all that you've given uh, to Calvary for the last uh, last couple of days, these these two sessions. So much appreciated. Yeah, I've got uh, one question for you, uh, Denny. Uh, I'm, your book that uh, I'm going to actually be the one of the teachers, two teachers doing it in our open class format. And so as one of those teachers, um, what would you encourage people to or the teachers to really how to teach your book and how to how to um, – you know, get the most out of it, so to speak. Yeah, there's the book, Male and Female, He Created Them, is designed for small group studies or, you know, church group studies where everybody, you know, does work during the week, you come back together, you meet, receive some teaching and discussion. So it's really designed for that. So you want everybody to read that. And as a leader, you want to read that. But the thing I would really press for leaders is do your best to root people, not in our book, but in Scripture, in other words, try to make the connections. I hope we're doing it in the script, in the book, but we want people to think biblically about these things. We want people's consciences held captive to what the Bible says was clearly taught in Scripture. So that's where I'm pushing leaders. I want leaders to do that. We want people's consciences held captive to Scripture, not to some unbiblical social program. That's not the point here. Yeah, um, it's to get people to think th- their thoughts after Jesus. So. As teachers, I would be pressing into understanding these scriptures and then being able to apply them to people. Hey, if you want some follow-up information, you can go to DennyBurke.com, D-E-N-N-Y-B-U-R-K.com. Or cbmw.org. Okay, so you can go to the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, get great information there, uh, blog articles, uh, dealing with current issues, resources too. So I, w- I would strongly encourage you to check both places out and give you some good things to follow up on. And we're going to continue this discussion and, and how we can live this out faithfully um, on a local church level, in our own homes and families. And so this is kind of just the beginning for us to really digging into this subject, and we're going to continue down this path and, and, and be faithful. We're going to commit to the Lord to be faithful and, and help each other live faithfully as his ambassadors moving forward. So, Denny, thanks a lot for being with us today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, brother. As always, um, at Calvary Baptist Church, we are for God and for Dothan and for the world. <laughs>